Hello and welcome to the hand building workshop. In this workshop we will be teaching you how to build the soft robotic hands RBO Hand 2 and the RBO Hand 3. The RBO Hand 2 is the deprecated model that you can see here. The RBO Hand 3 is our current model. As you can see, the RBO Hand is made of a basic scaffold, a silicon glove and complex fingers. Here we have an array of each of the steps you need to make an RBO Hand finger. Firstly, you will need to show you, we will need to show you how to make a connector plate, which will later be attached to the scaffold. Next, we will teach you about the molding process, where the connector plate is attached to the silicon. The next step is how to tube the fingers. Then, attaching the passive layer, which will close the finger. After that, we will teach you how to thread the fingers, in which the thread restriction is added, followed by the sealing step. When, the, uh, seal, uh, when we seal the thread into place using silicon, followed by the, uh, finishing the finger by adding the pulps. We'll also show you how to make the glove for the RBO Hand uh, 3 scaffold, and we'll also cover how to make the RBO Hand 3 thumb and any variations to these methods. To make the RBO hand 2. The very first step in our hand building workshop is to create these silicon bases. They are made out of soft silicon and have a connector plate attached to one end. Here are the three different designs used in the RBO hand 3. We have the P24 Awesome Short Finger, the P24 Awesome Very Short Finger, and the smaller P24 small thumb. The P24 small thumb is used for our thumb. The P24 awesome very short is for our pinky. And the P24 awesome short are for all the other three fingers. For the RBO hand 2, we use a different design using the so called P10 mold. The P10 fingers only have one chamber a thinner wall and are also softer than the P24 fingers. These four molds are the most important molds for you. Firstly, we're going to have to prepare the molds. For this step, you will need a mold holder. For the two two compartment fingers, the P24 awesome short and very short, you will need a small amount of passive layer material, which you will cut in a moment. You will also need the molds found in the box labeled often used molds. To hold the molds together, you will need some clips. For the two two compartment finger designs, first check that the fingertip is still inside the mold. This is a small 3D printed piece inside the tip of the finger. Next, we're going to cut a small piece of passive layer material and insert it between the two chambers. Over the years, we've had issues with the wall between the two chambers rupturing, and we could avoid these ruptures like this. Cut a small 1 cm times 1.5 cm rectangular piece out of the passive layer material. It's best to start bigger and trim pieces off until you have the right shape. Over time, you'll get a feeling of what size you need. This piece looks pretty good. You can double check if the piece has the right shape by putting it in position between the two chambers and adding the second mold piece. If the passive layer ne the fabric needs to bend, it needs trimming down. This is what it looks like ideally. Once you're satisfied, you can put your finger mold into the mold holder. Hold the two pieces together firmly so that the passive layer inside doesn't move around too much. Fix the molds in place with clips down the side, 3 to 4 on either side. There are small wings on the molds for this purpose. Use strong clips and check that there is no space between the molds, mold pieces, or your silicon will leak. Before you continue on to your next uh, mold, check that the passive layer is still in position and fix if necessary. 
the P24 very short also needs this passive layer piece. When adding shorter molds, be careful that the clips don't get in the way of the tip of the next mold. If molds are added at an angle, this can cause leaks. The P10 does not need that many passive layer, so it can be added straight onto the uh, mold. It does not contain any walls, therefore no passive layer. The P24 thumb, like the P10, contains no two compartments, therefore can be, go on directly. This is a shorter mold. So you can see that we've prepared a space between the clips for it to slide into. Once all your molds are on, finish off with this end piece that slides into position. This creates a basin for your silicon to rest in. Secure the end piece in onto the mold, mold holder by using two clips also. We've now got a prepared mold holder. Check that everything's secure and set it aside to prepare the silicon. To mold the fingers, we use dragon skin 10 slow silicon. This silicon comes in two components, A and B, in the yellow and blue bottle respectively. These components are mixed together at a one-to-one -one ratio, with a variance of approximately 10%. Therefore, if you want to make a 100 gram batch, you need to use 50 grams of one and 50 grams of the other, and can be off by approximately 5 grams for either component. Now, when you're making a whole batch of the silicon, you need to figure out how many fingers you're going to use and what, what kind, and then you can use these numbers to figure out how many grams you're going to need altogether. Before you finish your calculation, add approximately 20 grams for spillage or for potential cracks. So, for example, if you, for whatever reason, need to make four thumbs, you'd need 80 grams. And you add 20 grams, which makes 100 grams. So you need 50 grams from the yellow bottle and 50 grams from the blue bottle. With your calculations done, you can now use the shop scales, which are turned on by knocking at the bar at the bottom. Next, you need to clean a pot and a wooden stick. Wipe any residual silicon off of the stick. and tug the silicon out of the pot so you can use a clean pot. Once done, we place the pot on the scales, and then we calibrate the scales by tapping down. We now add the appropriate amount of component A, which in this case will be 150 grams. Remember that a 10% variance between the components is completely fine. Before adding component B, we recalibrate the scales again so that we can be sure they get approximately 150 grams of that too. With both components added, we add a small bit of silicon pigment. We really do not need a lot. Using a small spatula, we take a small amount from the pot
this very insignificant amount is completely sufficient for our 300 gram batch of silicon. We dunk it in a little bit. That's all we need. We take a big spatula to mix it around. Once we've reached a uniform mass, we can be sure that all three components, component A, component B, and the pigment, have all been mixed together neatly. We can use an old finger from the shop to make sure we've got the appropriate color. The next step is to add it into the vacuum chamber to get all the air bubbles out. You'll know you've pushed the acrylic down firmly enough when the suction engages and you can see the foam inside expand. You will also no longer be able to move the acrylic disc. You'll see bubbles start to form on the silicon as the air leaves. When the silicon is almost ready, you'll see the bubbles sink in on themselves. You'll need to wait another minute or two, and then first shut off the compressor before slowly release releasing the valve on the side of the tank. You'll hear the distinctive hissing sound of air being released. Be careful to release the valve slowly, as not to disrupt the pot. We can now pour it into the mold setup. When you've added enough silicon, you can tap it against the table to dislodge air bubbles inside the molds. You can choose to add more silicon at this point, and then put the whole rig into the vacuum chamber, and let that remove the air from the molds too. Once again, you'll see bubbles rise from the silicon as the pressure sinks. You can also open and close the valve, which jolts pressure into the chamber, rupturing the bubbles. After removing the rig from the air chamber, we can now add more silicon. Once again, we can tap it against the table to dislodge more bubbles. Once it's nicely settled, we can add the connector plates. The ones here are for the RBO Hand 3 2 compartment fingers. They have two holes and an M3 bolt protruding from them. Here's the connector plate for the thumb. It has no holes and a nut in place for the bolt. Finally, we have the connector plate for the P10 finger, which is distinctive for having the bolt in the center, not at the top. 
we add the connector plates straight down into the molds. Keep the plate horizontal. If you slip and the connector plate goes in, an at, in at an angle, you'll need to remove it, letting let the resulting bubble settle, add more silicon, and retry. The goal is that the connector plates are plain with the edges of the mold. Place the connector plates down and then use all four fingers, one on each corner, like this. We use the same system for the P-Tank finger. If there are any bubbles, just disrupt them with your finger before using the connect before adding the connector plates. Once again, we use two fingers from either hand to push it down firmly into place. The thumb works the same way, though in this case, the connector plate has slipped, so we'll need to refill the mold and retry in a moment. We're going to do the other connector plates in the meantime. Let's give it another go. This time it works out fine. Give each connector plate another check. Make sure they're straight and plain with the molds. And we add the rest of the excess silicon to the top. We now let all the molds set overnight. These rigs are placed in the shelf in the shop while they're drying. Now that the silicon is dry, we're going to remove the molds. First, check that the silicon is indeed dry, and then remove all the clips. As the silicon is settled, these are no longer needed. While this might be a tedious process, please try not to get hasty. If you try to remove molds without further preparation, you're likely to break the mold holder, which is fragile. Please be gentle. As a next step, we take a box cutter and cut along the edges of the silicon, as well as cutting across between each mold. You do not need to be particularly careful with this silicon, as it is excess. If you place tape to keep the mold closed, remove that now. Remove the end piece. And then using a thumb from either side, carefully remove each mold separately.
If you have difficulty keeping taking the molds apart, you can use a screwdriver to separate them or use the box cutter to finish off cutting between the pieces. With all molds removed, you can now clean up your workplace by removing all the excess silicon. Our next step will be to open the molds. To open the molds, we use a screwdriver and look for a crack along the mold sides into which we can insert the screwdriver as a lever. When using a screwdriver, treat it as, like a knife as it has sharp edges. Do not push the screwdriver towards your own hand as this can cause bloody injuries. Find a place to insert your screwdriver and lever it open at one to two centimeter intervals. Once ready, you can lever it open. Be careful to take care of the corners as they are easy to break. Once the molds open, you can simply peel out the silicon. Clean up the mold, check that the tip is still in, and place the two pieces of the mold back together clipping them to in place and setting them aside for future use. The process for the thumb is the similar one. Simply insert the screwdriver in a place between the molds and pieces and lever it open. Don't forget to keep the molds clean and the two pieces together. Once you've removed all the fingers from the mold, you can, you'll need to do quality control. First, you'll need to check for bubbles, especially bubbles close to the connector plates. If you find bubbles, the finger is probably unusable. In this picture, you can see a small bubble close to the connector plate. As the bubbles rise to the top, the bubbles are most likely just between the silicon and the connector plates. You'll get a feel for how small the bubbles can be so as not to ruin the finger over time. For now, if you're not sure, ask a colleague. Another thing you'll need to check for is lopsided connector plates. If the, lop if the connector plates have been added at an angle, this will cause the whole finger to be mounted at an uh, angle. This too is a sign of an unusable finger. Finally, once you are satisfied that there are no bubbles or no lopsided connector plates, trim the side. Finally, tidy up the edges of the finger by trimming off the thin mold artifacts on the side. When doing this, try to cut in straight lines and not to cut into the finger itself. Tidy up the tip of the finger too. Once you have a tidy, straight finger, we are ready to go on to the next step. Once the fingers are tidy and have been checked for imperfections, we're going to go on to the tubing. To attach the tubes to the fingers, we're going to need to drill through the holes in the connector plates. There are holes in place to guide us. We use these drill bits, a 3.5 or a 4mm. If you use any dr bigger drill bits, the holes in turn will be larger and can cause air leaks later in the process. 
That's why we advise not to use a larger drill bit. We also need a hole in the wall between compartments. To do this, we use a manual hole punch. For the thumb, it's a different story. The thumb doesn't have the two compartments, nor does it have a hole in the connector plate. Here the tube comes in through the side of the thumb. Before punching a hole through the side of the thumb, consider twice which side you're opening. The thumb is for the right hand, and the tube goes in towards the hand. We punch a hole in the center of the side between the third and fourth ridge. Once the holes have been drilled, we punch the holes through between compartments. To do this, take your hole punch in the second largest setting. Turn the finger inside out so that the wall is exposed and punch the hole. Twisting it makes the hole complete. Tubing the P10 finger, we only use a single tube. We use the hole that is closer to the passive layer. To add pneumatic tubing to our fingers, we need tubes. They come in spools like this. We have two different kinds of tubes. For the RBO hand 3, so for the P24 fingers and thumb, we use the thicker wall tubes, which can contain more air pressure. While the P10 fingers, so the RBO hand 2, still use the thinner walled weaker tubes. For the P24 fingers, we use two different lengths of tube, one longer, which can stretch into the further compartment, and one shorter that only needs to reach the base. The thumb, on the other hand, only needs a significantly shorter tube. Next, we can insert the tubes into the fingers that have been drilled in preparation. We have two tubes prepared, the longer of which goes through the hole closer to the passive layer and then follows on through the wall to the second compartment. The placement closer to the passive layer matters because the longer tube would otherwise restrict the curve of the finger during movement. Our preferred method of tubing is to use a needle and thread. Here I have a needle and thread prepared. Next, cut the tip of the tube to get a point. First we're going to do the shorter tube. We take the finger and turn the finger inside out and thread the needle out through the lower hole further from the passive layer in the connector plate. Then, once through, you thread the needle through the silicon tube close to where you cut the thread at an angle. Then you thread the needle back through the same hole you brought it out of. Keep the thread separate and untangled. Line the sharpened tube up with the hole and then gently but firmly pull it through.
then remove the thread. We now glue the tube into place. First, pull more tube than you'll need into the finger. As a glue, we're using Silpoxy. This is a silicon glue that you should wear gloves when using. It isn't exactly healthy for your skin. Flip your in finger inside out and apply a very small amount of Silpoxy around the hole in the base plate surrounding the tube. Put it into place, giving both the tube and the hole a uniform coat. Once you're satisfied, slowly pull the tube almost all the way back out of the finger, leaving approximately a centimeter inside. This is done in order to draw the silpoxy into the hole. Do this process slowly, as if you go too fast it can get rather messy and you'll need to redo the process. Now that it's been left to dry for 20 minutes, we can repeat the process, cutting the tube to a point, then taking the needle and threading it through both the finger and tube, and then back through the finger. If the hole in the connector plate got glued closed in the last step, you can redrill it to open it up again. As this time we are doing the longer of the two tubes, we need to go through the hole closer to the passive layer. This tube needs to get to the further compartment, through the wall between the compartments. For this, we use tweezers, push them through the hole in the compartment wall, and grab hold of the tube, pulling it through. Like in the last step, we use more tubing than we would actually need. This time we flip the second compartment inside out first, add glue around the hole. When gluing the compartment wall, You'll need to pay attention that you glue both sides of the compartment wall hole. Be careful to not use too much silpoxy as it can ruin the whole finger. Once again, you need to glue the compartment. The connector plate holes also. In this step, be careful to not cover the earlier tube, as this can reduce the airflow. Once again, pull it through, leaving approximately one centimeter of space. Remove the excess silpoxy and lay it to dry overnight. This longer drying period is important as the next step uses fluid silicon, which does not dry when it's in contact with wet silpoxy. Next, we go to tube the thumb. We've already punched a hole in the side. So once again, we take out the tweezers, insert them through the hole, and take hold of the silicon tube. Pull it through, 
turn the thumb inside out and glue it into place using some epoxy. Slowly draw it back out again to fill the hole and leave it to dry overnight. Once again, close the silk box here, otherwise it will dry out. After tubing the fingers, we now attach the passive layer. As we've already said, it needs to be dried overnight, otherwise the new silicon might not cure correctly. The passive layer is added here so that when the fingers are inflated, it bends in this direction, as the layer is not elastic. It's important to check that the tubes are not clogged before adding the passive layer, as this cannot be corrected after this step. Blow some air through the tubes to test it. We've now prepared a set of fingers, and we have two sizes of plates. On the back, you can see that the figure is for 200 milliliters of silicon, while the smaller is for 100 milliliters. As we are not making a large batch of fingers, we are going to settle for the smaller one. We now need to cut the passive layer fabric. This is the fabric we use. It is not stretchable in either direction. We now need to cut the size we'll need for this batch of fingers. Be careful to cut along the lines of the mesh, because if the passive layer is added, into the fingers at an angle, they will bend at unpredictable angles. If you're not sure how much you need, you can lay out the fingers to get an idea of the size you'll require. We've cut it out now, laid out with a little space around all the, of our pieces. It's important to not waste too much of the fabric, so please don't cut out more, much more than you'll need. It's also important to note that you need enough passive layer material behind the base of the finger as we need to have this extra flap at the end of our fingers, which we later flip over when uh, mounting them on the scaffold. This is also true for the thumbs. Before you put the fingers into the silicon, make sure that the fingers are completely clean and don't have any artifacts or remnants from drilling or dirt, as this can st uh, cause a failure later. We've now prepared some dragon skin 10. While the plate says 100 milliliters, our passive layer sheet is a little smaller, so we used 80 milliliters instead. Next, we're going to add a very thin layer of, la uh, of dragon skin onto this plate and then use an acrylic plate to smoothen it out so that the silicon is spread out thinly and evenly. Next, add the passive layer and smooth it out so that there are neither creases nor air bubbles to be seen. Next, add the rest of the silicon on top and smooth it out again. Once the silicon is nice and smooth, we can place the fingers into it carefully. We place them down on it and push them down into the silicon. Try to avoid the tubes touching the wet silicon. 
The last step for today is to weigh the fingers down into the passive layer with weights. There are many different options for weights, and you can use anything suitable and heavy you find in the workshop. Some fingers need more weight, some will need less. If you're making peach hen fingers, be very careful as they are softer and much more likely to buckle under weight. Be sure to distribute weight carefully so that the finger doesn't change shape. Especially spreading out can be a real trouble. After a night's rest to dry, you can remove all of the weights. Some of them might have fallen into the silicon. This is not a big concern. You can remove the whole sheet from the plate and inspect your batch from underneath. Check for large bubbles. Here we can see some smaller bubbles, which are not necessarily a problem. We'll just need to check later whether the fingers still work. You can now cut the fingers apart. And then neatly cut the fingers out. Try to cut them as straight as possible along the sides. And try not to cut into the silicon of the finger either. Take your time with this task. Don't forget to leave the flap on. Once you're finished, the fingers are ready to be set aside for threading. We're now going to do the step known as threading. Threading means we're going to wrap thread around our silicon fingers to control the way that the finger moves when inflated and so it doesn't blow up randomly like a balloon. Before we start this process, make sure to test your pieces. If they don't work, there's no use threading them. Here we have three P24 fingers, one P10 finger, and a thumb. With a P10 finger, Use a clip to keep the, a crease in the tube to keep the air inside so the process of threading does not compress it. First we'll show you the methods for starting the threading process, then show you the current threading technique. There are two ways to start threading. The first is to use superglue. Take your thread and place one end at the connector plate. While the air compartments only start a centimeter further down, we always start this process at the very base of the finger. This can be confusing as the for the first segment there are no red ridges to thread into. To start threading, you place the thread across the passive layer and secure it in place with superglue. Then leave it to dry. When the glue's dry, you can start threading. It makes sense to secure the spool of thread in place before starting to thread, otherwise it might roll away. To finish the glue method, when you're done threading, pull the end of the thread over the beginning and glue that in place too. A more advanced method is to tie it into place before we start. 
align the thread with the ridge between silicon and connector plates and tie two simple knots. Go ahead and leave the short end hanging to, know, uh, to knot with again once you're done threading. Knot made, shift the line into the ridge and make sure the knot itself is at the center of the passive layer, as that is where we're starting to thread from. Now that we're ready to thread, we secure the spool. Make a securing circlet around. And slowly begin to circle the thread around the finger in a coil without a millimeter between turns. After a couple of millimeters, there are small ridges cast into the silicon as a guide. We lay thread into every second of these ridges on the way down, and every second After a couple of centimeters, there's a short gap in the ridges. We continue the process here as usual and simply make it one large space and to continue skipping every second ridge. If your threading isn't neat enough or the thread has started to slip around, simply use a small set of tweezers to correct the placement. Don't pull the thread too tight while threading, as this can cause the finger to bend in its resting state. You need to find a balance between pulling too tight and leaving the thread too loose. This is why thread often slips around and we don't pull it as tight as possible. At the tip of the finger, you loop around and then cross over your own thread and continue the process in reverse, making sure that the threads only cross over each other on the passive layer. You will note that there are two crossovers for each turn. Again, at the knuckle, we leave a space free and continue towards the base. We're using the tying method in this case, so we tie the place in thread, the thread in place. and cut off the excess thread. When we're done, we give it a once over. And correct small imperfections. This finger is now ready for sealing.
Threading the thumb is a little simpler. First, tie the thread into place and adjust the position. We start in the same manner as before. In this case, as with the P10 finger, the ridges are wider and the turns further apart. When you reach it, accommodate the tubing by simply sliding thread beside it on either side. This thumb's done now too. The P10 finger is the same process. Just make sure that the air is sealed in and don't apply too much pressure while threading. Here you can see that the crossover has traditionally happened on the side and not on the passive layer. This one too is ready for sealing. The step following threading is to seal the thread into place so the thread doesn't slip around. For this we use some fresh silicon. Ideally you do this after casting some fingers or making the passive layer so you still have some silicon left over. We use the dragon skin 10 for this process. To apply the silicon, use a wooden depressor, take a small amount of silicon, and smear it onto the finger. Don't use too much, and put what you don't need back in the pot. The process is to smear it on, and then scrape it back off again, so that we have a very thin layer of silicon covering the thread, but not interfering with the movability of the finger. Be careful not to shift the threading around when you're doing this. It's best to go with the direction of the thread. When all the threading has been covered, and all the excess silicon has also been scraped back off, you can either set it to dry on its front face, or you can continue with the same process with the front face, and then hang the finger up by its tubing to dry. Make sure to cover the part where the thread starts and ends, so that that is secured in place. Check once more for excess silicon, and then use a clip to hang it up from a shelf in the workshop. If you notice silicon dripping from when it's hanging, you'll know that you use way too much silicon. Go back and scrape some more off. Once it's dried, it's done.
The last step to making fingers is to add the tops to the finished heel fingers. We need to create the pulps first, which are soft and are designed to go on the front of the fingers, to give the fingers a frictive soft layer. To make our pulps, we'll use these five molds. This bigger one is for the thumb pulp. These three are for the P24 short, which are the middle three fingers of the hand. And the one on the end is for the P24 very short which is the pinky. As usual, these molds consist of two pieces. Like when making the fingers, we use a mold holder, but here we use a special pulp mold holder. Once again, please be gentle with our mold holders, they are fragile. On the side of the molds, you can see wings or clips similar to on the finger molds. We'll, we have space on our mold holders for four pulps, as the thumb mold doesn't need one. Here, the mold has space at the top for uh, excess silicon. Again, we place the molds into the mold holder and clip the pieces together. As usual, at the end we add an end piece. Instead of securing the end pieces in place with clips, we use tape. The thumb mold goes together with clips on its own. For the pulps, we use the EcoFlex 30 silicon, which is softer than the Dragon Skin 10 we've used for the fingers. Once again, we need to calculate how much silicon we'll need. For each of our molds, we'll need about 12 grams of silicon, so for 5 pulps, we'll need about 60 grams. 60 grams divided by 2 is 30, so we need 30 of each component. When mixing together less than 100 grams of silicon, Use only a small plastic cup, as you'll lose too much of the silicon if you use a big pot. Here in this video, we did a small miscalculation and ended up making only 50 grams. As we don't add any colour to the pulps, it's difficult to know when the silicon is fully mixed. So you'll need to pay extra attention to mixing it completely thoroughly. Once it's very well mixed, place the silicon into the vacuum chamber. Once it's been vacuumized, pull the silicon into the molds and place them into the vacuum chamber again. When pouring the EcoFlex, be very careful as it is much more fluid than the Dragon Skin 10 so it's more likely to leak out of the cracks. Pour it in slowly so you can notice and react to any leaks quickly. Once the molds have been gone in the vacuum chamber and are ready to be left to set, check on it after about 20 minutes to make sure that there aren't any leaks. Like with the Dragon Skin 10, EcoFlex 30 needs about 8 hours or overnight to cure. Once they've dried overnight, you can remove the pulps from their molds. Remove the clips, then slowly push each mold out of the holder. Once again, use a screwdriver to leave the pieces apart. When you're levering pieces like this open with a screwdriver, don't point it towards your hand, as you can give yourself a nasty injury like that. Once the mold is open, slowly pull the pulp out of the mold. Be slow and gentle, 
as this silicon is very soft. It could break easily. When it's out of its mold, the pulp will look like this. We'll next remove any pieces of the pulp we don't need. If you look at it on the finger like this, you can see that we do not need this extra flap. Use scissors to remove the pieces that aren't required. Cut across straight so that it looks pretty. Also remove any small artifacts from the molding process. To attach it to the finger, we then take some silpoxy, the seal finger, and a wooden depressor to glue the pulps. Add a good amount of silpoxy on both the front face of the finger as well as onto the back of the tip. When you've got enough glue, press the pulp into place and make sure it's stuck on properly all over. Your finger is ready to be attached to the RBO hand 3 20 minutes later. Next, we'll show you how to create the glove. The glove is attached to the scaffold of the hand and will give the palm of the hand necessary grip. Normally, we create the glove and the pulps in the same step because it's the same type of silicon, Ecoflex 30. To make the glove, we use this glove mold, which doesn't use a mold holder. Instead, to keep this mold together, we use these clamps. Important to pay attention that the clamps plus mold can fit into the vacuum chamber. Some clamps are longer than others. Pay attention to use short ones. When you lower the clamps into the vacuum chamber, both the mold and the clamps need to fit in. Check this before you pour the silicon. You attach the clamps to the mold here and here at the base and at the neck of the mold. When clamped, you'll still see some cracks between the mold pieces. Use tape to cover these up. You need approximately 150 grams of silicon for the glove. For the gloves, we use Ecoflex 30, like for the pulps. We don't usually add a color to the glove, except for specific prototypes. 150 grams plus 10 grams for a loss makes 160, so we'll add 80 grams of each component. Mix it well, and then put the pot of silicon into the vacuum chamber to get the air out. The silicon is then ready to pour into the glove mold. Before you do, check that the mold plus clamps assembly fits into the vacuum chamber. Then pour the silicon into the mold. The next day, when the silicon is dry, you can uh, remove the glove. You'll see now if there were any leaks that left the silicon, let the silicon pour out. To get the glove out, remove any tape in the clamps and apply a screwdriver between the pieces to lever it open. This can be quite a struggle.
approximately 10 hours later. Once your glove is out, clean up the mold and then take your scissors to cut off the excessive uh, silicon. Your goal is to cut and get a straight edge around the wrist of the hand so these top pieces can be removed. Nice end piece, the excess mold is off and you're done making your glove. Next, we're going to build the connector plates. They connect with the silicon base of the finger. They are necessary for attaching the fingers to the hand scaffold. They are small discs made of soft fabric, acrylic plates and screws. We're going to show you a step-by-step -step of how to make them, and when we're done, they're stored in this small plastic cup you can find in the workshop. Our first step is to laser cut the acrylic plates. We use 4mm clear acrylic plates. If you're not sure, use a measuring tool to check that the plates you're using are actually 4mm. Usually, the acrylic plates look like this in the shop. Simply remove the white foil before laser cutting. In the basement, you can use the laser cutter using these settings. Vector for cutting and gravure for engraving. Once you are done, you will have these pieces. These are the basic connector plates. On one side, they are engraved 1-2mm to two millimeters into the acrylic. At the top, we have engraved an indentation into which we can later insert the bolt. In total, there are three holes. For the next step, safety gloves are necessary, as we are using this chemical primer. As this is toxic, try to avoid getting it on the table or on your skin. We use the primer to roughen the engraved side even further. To do this, just paint small amounts of primer over every engraved piece of the plates. When you are done, close the primer bottle and leave the plates to dry for 1-2 to two minutes. When the plates are dry, you can now add the bolts. We use M3 10mm hex head bolts, which are specific to the RBO M3. Please make sure to use 10mm, as any more or less causes issues in assembly. Take the bolt and place it through the top hole. The bolt hit fits perfectly through our connector plates, with the hex head neatly filling the engraved indentation. Next, we take the super glue and we add a little bit of glue around under the bolt head into the indentation. Don't use too much and don't to use too little. You'll get a hang of it with practice. Once done, push the bolt firmly back into place. And once again, let the plates dry. When you are done, please don't forget to recap your super glue before moving on to anything else, even if it's more correct to plates. When the connector plates are once again dry, we can attach the connector plates to the fabric. This soft fabric we use has one light and one dark side. We use the soft material of the dark side to adhere to the connector plates. The other white side, which is even softer, will later be submerged in silicon. The first step is to cut a strip out of the fabric which is slightly wider than our connector plates at all. Once done, we use super glue again, which we put onto the engraved white side of the plates. We be careful to add glue over the head of the bolt as well as on the bridge between the two holes. We then attach it to the fabric. And secure it in position with office clips. The next connector plate follows the same pattern.
After our second connector plate is added to the strip, we can add an alternating clip on the other side to keep that side secure too. This is what it will look like when it is ready to be left to dry, this time overnight. It's important to leave it overnight, as superglue, when wet, stops silicon from vulcanizing. Lastly, once again, don't forget to close the superglue. The final step is cutting the connector plates into shape. To do that, first remove the clips. Then cut the plates apart from each other. Next, tidy up the edges. If you used too much glue in the last step, it might have squeezed out of the sides and caused ragged edges, which can cause problems later. Once the edges are neat, you are done making your connector plates. Don't forget to tidy your workstation after you're done. We have two variations on the connector plates. The one we use in the thumb, which has a nut inside the connector plate instead of a bolt, and it lacks the familiar holes. The second variation is the connector plate for the P10 fingers, which have a longer bolt in the center of the connector plate. The process for both of these is essentially the same. We use different files when laser cutting, as the thumb piece doesn't require the holes, and we embed these M3 nuts into the uh, holes instead of the bolt. The P10 plate needs these longer bolts 